Hello, um, I'm Irene Halliburton, sometime malaria scientist, sometime history student, both at the University of Dundee. As part of my Masters in Scottish History, I surveyed the witchcraft accusations for the County of Perth. And while I think we're all aware of this period in Scottish history, as a native of the area, I had no idea how this had affected Perthshire. I'm going to share some of my discoveries with you today. So Perth is considered by some to be the birthplace of the Reformation in Scotland. Knox's sermon of the 11th of May 1559 saw the beginning of the violent destruction of many Catholic places of worship and the attempted overthrow of the Catholic monarchy of the country. It might not be unreasonable to hold the expectation that the area would have been particularly energetic in its pursuit of the ungodly in the form of witches. The Witchcraft Act of 1563 was passed in the wake of the Reformation. An act of the Second Protestant Parliament, it was a move by the government to establish Protestantism by legal as well as religious means, part of an attempt to make Scotland both politically and ecclesiastically the most godly of countries, while still under a Catholic monarch. This made the witch hunt in Scotland primarily a Protestant crusade. It was a platform for the Reformed Church to demonstrate its fight against the perceived superstition of the Catholic Church. Kirk Sessions spent much of their time publicly punishing their congregations for fornication, adultery and other such crimes. But witchcraft was the one that crossed from ecclesiastical into secular law, the punishment being much more than public humiliation. The prime suspect of the original drafter of this act is Knox, and in his typical over-the-top style, some of the stronger language had to be altered before it could be ratified. As a scientist, I like graphs, and, but these are the only ones I'll show you today. Given that uh, lots of libraries and archives um, are only now letting people back in, I wouldn't have been able to do this work if it hadn't been for other people. So in 1938, George Black published his calendar of witchcraft cases in Scotland. This didn't claim to be comprehensive, but provided information on more than a thousand cases. In 1977, in the University of Glasgow, Christina Larner, Christopher Lee and Hugh McLachlan published their source book of Scottish witchcraft. This is part of a research project funded by the Social Sciences Research Council. It was the first attempt to gather records systematically, particularly from central sources, and this raised the number of cases to just over 3,000. In the 1990s, in the course of his doctoral research on Fife, Stuart MacDonald produced a revised version of the source book, this raised the number of cases to 3,230. This is available on CD-ROM and now forms the basis of the, Scot the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft. This contains almost 4,000 records and was produced by Julian Goodyear at the University of Edinburgh in 2003. This is available online for all inquiries and it has limited graphical representation, which I've um, also shown in my graphs, um, and has now been added to with a mapping project which gives a more user-friendly interface for the general public. So logic dictates that I approach this in chronological order. A nickneaming of Mani near Creef is the first relevant record in the source book, and this is dated 1563. We don't have many details at this point, but this is not the last time we hear of this lady. The first group of significance is from 1568. This is only five years after the passing of the Act. Perth is the residence of five representatives of this group of around 42 individuals. They were tried by Royal Commission issued by the Earl of Argyll, the Justice General of Scotland, and supported by the Regent Murray. The accused reside in places as disparate as Schoon, Cross Angus, the Mairns, and as far as Arbroath. The source reference for these is the family papers of one of the commissioners, Lord Logal. Ogilvy of Airlie, in the form of the Airlie monuments. We have the name of six commissioners who tried the accused. They're all prominent men in the area. This case doesn't appear in Larner's source book as it wasn't discovered until 1979. These cases contribute almost the entire first peak of accusations in the Scottish witchcraft trials for 1568. Speculation can suggest a fairly localised campaign by the reformed Kirk taking advantage of the passing of legislation enabling this commission for trial. A connection can also be made with the Marianne civil wars and the lords of Angus and Mairn 
were not all supportive of the Marianne cause, but the local lairds were in full support of these charges, as commissioners involved in the trial were all staunchly Protestant and local. Being it is it appears to be the first major trial in Scotland and held locally, it holds an important place in the history of Scottish witchcraft trials. The Earl of Murray, as a Protestant regent, was eager to support the reformed Kirk and used these trials, which he personally oversaw, to consolidate the partnership of civil and ecclesiastical authorities. In 1577, Violet Marr, who we can see as a high-born lady, judging by the members of her assize, was accused and executed for committing treason by the use of witchcraft, sorcery, incantation and the invocation of sprites to cause harm to the king's regent, the Earl of Morton. Violent Mars is an early example of the use of the act to charge those suspected of treason with witchcraft. Hers is the third only to the well-documented case of Janet Boyman, who foretold the death of the regent in 1570, and that of William Stewart, Lion King of Arms. He was accused directly by James Stewart, the young king's regent, of plotting against his life in 1569. Murray's position as Protestant regent to the son of a Catholic queen was tenuous, and he was likely very untrusting of any threat involving superstitious activity. Even in his minority, witches were being pursued as a threat to James VI and the Scottish throne. At the time of this trial, the young James was in the care of Annabel, the widow of the recently deceased Regent Marr. Annabel was actively involved in ensuring Violet came to justice, and this episode may have set James on the path to his later involvement in the North Berwick Witch Trials and publication of his demonology in 1591. Marjorie Black and John Miller are tried in Perth by the Northern Circuit Court in 1558 for a murder they carried out three years previously. Alongside multiple accusations of adultery, they were accused of bewitching William Robertson before taking his life. There's no mention of their fate as the case was referred back to the Justice Air of Perth. James VI had tried to re-establish circuit courts as part of judicial reforms in 1587, but under the weight of an Edinburgh Central Court and the lack of appropriate personnel, this did not succeed. In 1589, Kudo Watson was accused of witchcraft, but the Kirk Session dismissed the case as slander, as claims could not be substantiated. Accusations of slander were often thrown at women who had upset their neighbours and, and Kirk Sessions, as the most local of courts were often called to deal with and investigate the matter. As in this case, those who cried witch were required to do public penance for their slander. Kudo's ac accusers bore the same surname as her husband, which may have been coincidence. But an unfounded accusation of witchcraft could do serious harm to a woman's livelihood. Others would refuse to associate with her in case they were suspected as well. It wasn't unusual to bring a, an accusation of slander to the Kirk Session to have the name cleared. These are the only three cases in the, of local activity around the panic of 1590-91, and even this is tenuous. Black and Miller were accused of a murder which happened in 1585, and Kuro Watson's accusation may well have been part of a family argument. Julian Goodyear uses the case of Perth and Christian Stewart in 1569 to discuss the beginnings of the Scotch witchcraft panic of 1597. <clears throat> Christian's case escalated from a minister in Perth to being heard by James VI himself. Goodyear suggests that this high profile case may have put ideas to those of influence looking to create unrest. This was a period of great political instability, but also a time of famine and plague. And it's been suggested by some that part of the cause of this particular panic could be the consumption of rye flour contaminated with the fungus Claviceps purpurea, more commonly known as ergo. This theory has been discredited here and in the notorious Salem witch trials in the US, where the idea found great popular appeal. 1597 also saw contention around evidence required for the conviction of witchcraft and whether it was lawful to transport witches to be tried elsewhere. 
This divided secular and ecclesiastical authorities, with the church becoming frustrated with magistrates over the release of those accused of witchcraft. The case of Janet Robertson in this period created a point of contention in Perth. She was held for an extended period of time without execution. Secular authorities are, are demonstrating less enthusiasm than the ecclesiastic and the witch-hunting consensus appears to have broken down. Goodyear also suggests that Perth experienced a large-scale witch-hunt in 1597. The only evidence for this is from the Chronicle of Perth, the great number of witches burnt on the inch. This could be connected to the General Assembly held in Perth in this year, lending fuel to local religious fervour. But by the late 1590s, the Privy Council are establishing their authority as the issuers of commissions of judici judiciary to try witches, actively trying to stop James from granting permission for trials and bringing them to a much more regulated process. Well, while the names of the witches tried in 1597 are elusive, we have six for 1598. Four names appear in the database. An additional two are provided in the Chronicle of Perth. The numbers in the database are too low to be considered significant in themselves. But with the addition of the cases from the Chronicle and Christian Stewart, we do come to a number that could be significant over this period. To try and quantify, a database search on accused for 1597 and 98 returns 123 for the whole of Scotland. Perth returns only four. But when we consider the great numbers of witches burnt from the Chronicle, it could become significant. After the frenetic witch hunting activity in the closing years of the 16th century, there is a pause across Scotland. One case here in the interim is that of David Roy, sometime cook at Dalhousie in 1601. He was charged with consulting a witch to aid him in the seduction of his employer's daughter. When his advances were refused, he forced himself on her. Despite confessing and pleading guilty con to consulting a witch and rape, he was found innocent when tried locally. This verdict was overturned by the Privy Council after appeal by the victim's family. This case is quite informative as it gives details of the potion and the procedure that the amorous man was given to follow by the witch. By daubing on an apple and infusing a portion of his own nature in it and getting her to eat it, laced her drink with Spanish fly and gave her a drink made with daffodil. 14% of the uh, cases in the witchcraft database involve men. But if we search on the characterisation of consulting, we actually get 44%. So while other men had their reasons, many of them probably treason, how many were only interested in love? So the next series of accusations in the county of Perth come in the period 1612 to 1615, with a total of 14 cases found in the database. This seems like a high number out with a recognised period of panic, until we consider that eight of these are connected. Robert Erskine and his sisters were accused of plotting and killing their nephews in the spirit of covetous, covetousness in order to obtain their father's land. They consulted Janet Irving to obtain the herbs required to poison the boys and the sisters are named as those who instigated and drove their brother to commit this crime. Louise Yeoman's research shows that high status women were rarely accused of witchcraft but when they were, property was usually involved. In this case, the women are not only accused, but mainly executed for the crime of consulting. One sister, Helen's sentence was later reduced on account of her penitent status. This case was tried locally, but we don't have any evidence of their fate, apart from those who were executed. But the sole commissioner named in this case was none other than the relative of the accused and the deceased, Don Erskine, the seventh Earl of Mar. Okay. 
The final case in the County of Perth in this period is Catherine or Kate McNiven. The date for her execution is 1615 in both the source book and the database. But checking back on the original source for Larner, Ferguson, he actually states that she was burnt probably about 1715. This is the famed witch of Manee, who is, among other things, believed to be the last witch to be burned in Persia. She is also believed to have spat a raw emerald as she went to her death by burning at the Knock of Creef, despite the attempts of the Laird of Inchbrakey to save her. There is still discussion over the date, which date is correct, but it's not stopped her having a secure place in the folklore of the village. Two detailed records are available for 1623. Margaret Holmesclough is mentioned in records transcribed in the Book of Perth from April to June of that year. The details of the case accuse Margaret of taking the milk from cows and transferring illness from one person to another. These are classic accusations characterising the Scottish witch. The Kirk Session are keen to obtain a commission for a trial and once discussed, once imprisoned, there is much discussion around claims to her goods while she is incarcerated. Incarcerating witches is quite an expensive um, business and their goods were often sold off to pay for their own incarceration and trial. In July, Janet Barry is accused of consulting an unnamed witch to help her sick child. While not being treated to the full force of secular law, she is forced to publicly repent over the next few weeks. Another consultor, Janet Jackson, is accused of approaching Isabel Haldane for help with a sick child. The witch washes the child's shirt in a sacred well and ritually prepares a cake designed to cure the child of a cake mark. This is more, more than likely a port wine birthmark. The details in these cases is very informative, again giving an insight in the activities considered to be witchcraft. These women hold power in the community and other women have sought their help in times of need. The Perth Kirk session, while they don't have to, appear to go lightly on the female consultors, perhaps perceiving their desperation, although Hormsclough and Haldane were both executed. Despite the reformed religion, most people still had a strong belief in the power of the supernatural, but also in the power of the basic medicinal preparations many of the witches could provide. Bessie Wright appears in the Kirk Session records for 1628. She's a resident of Quarry Mill near Schoon. Wright also has an established reputation for one who offers cures. She's been banished from Perth and from practising within its bounds. She frequently ignores this, and it's on another repeat of this disregard that her mention is here. She declares to have had a book a thousand years old, which was taken from her by representatives of the church. She's a nuisance more than anything and in and out of imprisonment. Bessie's fate is, is not also not known. We continue on the healing thread. And 1629 saw the culmination of the case of Alexander Drummond of Octorarder, where he was hanged and burned in Edinburgh. He was suspected of unlawful cures, charms and abuses of the people. This is the case of a folk healer who was much supported locally resulting in him being held and interrogated elsewhere before he was tried centrally. This case is extensive, too much really for me to discuss here, but Reid in his 1899 Annals of Octorarder and Memorials of Strathern dictates a whole chapter to the warlock of the Curtain of Octorarder. Drummond is the only case in Perth which coincides with 1629 to 1630 witch hunting peak in Scotland. The case of John Brough of Fottaway in 1643 is not dissimilar to Alex Drummond. He's a charmer, a healer and a soothsayer. He frequently used water and enchanted stones in his work to create curative infusions. The accusations against him read like a textbook case and include the demonic pact, digging up of corpses and the use of their flesh against other people. It appears that his success was his downfall as his help was so sought he could not fail but to attract the attention of the authorities. There are three additional cases associated, associated with his trial in the same year. These are 
involve a curious family group of gales, and it specifically says in the database that they are gales. Nick Neving, who we mentioned at the beginning, her niece and her niece's son-in-law, John McElvory, is named as Bruff's accomplice. An addendum was added to the Act in 1649, and this actually emphasised punishment for consulters and added the demonic elements that we're starting to see coming up in the cases. The only major period of um, witch hunting in Perth comes in 1662. This is actually the case across the whole of the country. There are 58 cases in the database. I've recently claimed two that I think were wrongly assigned into Fife as Forg and Denny, and these consist of eight uh, distinct groups. Findegask, Fertivi at Forg and Denny and Dunning were all tried by the same group of commissioners on the same day, so we could consider them together. Unfortunately, the source of information for these is the Privy Council records, um, and access to those is not currently available. However, despite the same source, there is more detail about the case at Rind. Nine women were accused, and a story of illegal imprisonment and extraction of confession by torture involving a large group, 16 local men, emerges. A commission for the trial was granted and four of them were executed, but the Privy Council appear to have been so alarmed by the confessions and the method of extraction that all 16 men were given official reprimands. The remaining women were then sent to Edinburgh for trial. This trial came at a time when authorities were beginning to question the abuses committed in the process of obtaining confessions. Trials became more closely supervised and more emphasis was placed on judicial proof. The Cook of Devon case is not found in official records. Larner's source of information again comes from Reed in a chapter entitled The Witch Coven at the Creek of Devon. The 13 originally accused, 12 women and a man, a man, were examined over five trials held in the parish of Fossilby at Creek of Devon. These were held over the summer and autumn of 1662 and in addition to the original 13 charged, another 23 women were implicated. And this was again a recognised characteristic of the 1662 panic. Reid describes this as a wholesale holocaust of witches and was not known to have happened on this scale anywhere else in Scotland. The reproduction of the case details is an invaluable example of concessions, confessions and are a rich source of information on the beliefs of the period, recounting the demonic pacts, the clothes that the women wear, wore, the details of their activities at their coven meetings, how they each became acquainted with the devil and how the devil appeared to them. In line with the rest of Scotland, there are few accused witches in Persia after 1662. There are two accusations, individual accusations in the late 17th century, then none until well into the 18th. Christina Larner considered that the witch hunts in Scotland were over by 1700, but we still have documented cases. There are three women detailed in Samuel Cowan's Perth, the ancient capital of Scotland, who were, tried and who were apprehended and tried by parliamentary commission. They were executed on the 21st of July. 1715 was the year of the first Jacobite rebellion and Perth was a strategic target. It was eventually taken, in September, in, taken by them in September, but in the run up to this, tension was high in the city and political tension leads to paranoia and suspicion. Tension within the town may have been a contributing factor in this late episode. The Act was repealed by an Act of Central Government in 1736, but it does not rapidly depart the psyche of the populace. A belief in witchcraft still lingered, brown trees still survived in the cottage garden, and a fear of accusation remains a real threat. A young boy from Carpu near Abernethy, John Brown, suffered accusations of witchcraft and consultation with the devil due to his untutored learning of Greek, Latin and Hebrew. 
So much so that in 1745, he felt the need to write to the local moderator of the Kirk session, defending himself. His later entry to a school of divinity was objected to by one of the members on the grounds that his learning came from the devil. The boy later became the Reverend John Brown of Haddington, professor of divinity and author of the self-interpreting Bible. One case that doesn't appear in any um, in the case book or in the um, database comes from the Kirk Session records of April 1631 and is only mentioned in Daliel's 1835 Darker Superstitions of Scotland. There are no names associated with this, which may be why the certain women rumoured to have been seen walking on the waters of the Tay at midnight were never apprehended. And it's with these women I will conclude. This is a specially commissioned modern version of a woodcut created by local artist Linda Allen. I purposefully used the word fear to my title today for its dual interpretation, to be frightened or to be feared, to me speaks of the different aspects of witchcraft. Life was a tenuous balance, health and sickness, feast, famine, subsistence or destitution. Medicine as we know is not available. The charmers and healers were the people who could stave off or cure disease, and in the case of John Guthrie, were often protected by the community they lived in as the only resort for the sick or those trying to keep their children well. Even those seeking their help, however, faced the potential for torture, trial, and ultimately execution. Daily survival, intertwined with hopes, fears, and superstitions, were very immediate to the survival of a community. Neighbours were interdependent and community stability was crucial. Those who appeared to disrupt the balance were othered, those who scold and argue with their neighbours, who curse some Michelle. Witchcraft was a convenient accusation to throw at them, to potentially remove the problem and to have the status quo restored. From the cases I've described, Perthshire saw accusations at every level. 124, actually 125, because I found another one last week. Um, we have consultors, murderers, healers, the Cursalier, the Coven, and many others for whom we don't know the accusations against them. We'll probably never know the full extent of witchcraft accusations and ex execution in Perthshire or across the whole of Scotland, as speculation continues on the numbers. The example of the 1662 Cook of Devon group may represent just a fraction of the cases which were only ever represented in local texts that have now been lost. We still have quite a lot to find out, I think. For those who'd like to read more on the cases of Violet Marr, Alexander Drummond, John Bruff and the Covenant Cook of Devon, Alexander Reed's Annals of Octorada is available online at Electric Scotland. The interactive map and the uh, witchcraft database are available through the University of Dundee. And I can't finish without a final mention of Maggie Wall. She was probably the first Persia witch that I and lots of others were aware of. She doesn't appear in any official records and we have no idea what she was accused of. I will leave you, however, with the information that at the time of her death, John Bruff was believed to be resident in Dunning.